Thanks, everybody. Oh, woo, that's very nice, thank you. Uh, welcome to Build, I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Last year, a show about women's wrestling in the 80s took audiences by storm. Glow, this is a show that I love, I deeply love Glow, is returning to Netflix for season two on June 29th, and this season it's even funnier, smarter, and bone-breaking than the first. Let's take a look. One, two, three. Glow! Yeah! Oh, fuck, it's our film. Ladies, exciting stuff. Feels a little different around here. And we got a few men in the gym, finally. Woo! Hubba hubba. All right, don't distract them. They have work to do. I'm excited. Aren't you excited? My costume still smells like beer and racism. Was I supposed to wash these? Did you have a good break? Yeah. I'm just getting divorced. It's complicated. Usually you do a lot better job of keeping your weird friendship stuff out of the ring. Just hope she can keep up. You're on the show, right? Glow, uh, welfare queen. <laughs> What'd you call my mom? It's a wrestling show. I'm not the only offensive character. Everyone's offensive. We have fans. I mean, the girls get letters. There's weirdos waiting outside for me. Wait. You're my favorite. I can see that. We're gonna be canceled. I can't believe this. I think this might have something to do with me. That is how this business works. It shouldn't be that way. They gave a men's wrestling show our slot. So you just let them do whatever they want? Uh -uh. Fuck no. Fuck no! Fuck no. Fuck no. Fuck no. Fuck no. What are we gonna do about it? I say we do whatever the hell we want to do. Set the weirdos free and see what happens. If you want to be respected, you gotta make yourself useful. I know what I'm worth, and I'm not apologizing to anyone. Everything is gonna be hard. I forgot to pick up my son at daycare today. I don't want to make this show that. Who's ready to do this? Look, I know this is going to be hard. But I believe in miracles, and we are going to make this miracle happen. We are the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. You want to wrestle with mommy? So when you're older, you can talk about it with your therapist. Oh, everybody, please hey. welcome Betty Gilpin and Mark Marin of Glow. Yeah. All right, that person is very excited. That's a very... This isn't actually the wrestling ring, so it's, but this is nice, but that's okay, that's great. Uh, I like this strangely spaced audience feel. Yeah. This is like this on GMA, too. You just walk out on the set, and you're like, we're just scattered people? You're just going to have scattered people? Under oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, this is great. <laughs> let's, do, let's do 22 minutes about the, about the audience. I, I could. Don't. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, he would. <laughs> Take over, Mark. Betty, microphone's down. Mm. Uh, I love Glow. I told you this in the green room. I really love this show. Um, I think it's one of the most entertaining, fun, smart shows that there are on television. The first season was wonderful. Uh, did you have any worry going into the second that you were going to be able to do it again? Did you know at all what was going to be happening with your characters in the second season? Yeah, I mean, for me, honestly, I don't always love a second season of anything. <laughs> you just want I'm to be like, canceled right out of the game. <laughs> no, not the oh. things I'm in. But for as a viewer, I'm like, I love the first season. Do I need more? And honestly, I think the second season is is better than the first. No, one. definitely. Yeah, I, I, we didn't know anything about the scripts because I think when we get there, maybe one and two is written, and then they're actually writing throughout the season. So you don't get a script until maybe a week, maybe, yeah. before we shoot the thing. But none of us really knew what was gonna happen with the characters. My concern was, would my pants still fit? Um, you know, things like that. Would you I gained be, weight? I don't, I always think I have, but it just did the shoes. I, my worries were like, am I gonna be able to be that guy? Um, so it all seemed to work out. And the season is, it gets deeper with her, it gets deeper with me, it gets deeper with a, a few of the other characters. Yeah. You know, the agenda is sort of different. There's more wrestling. So it was a much, it's a better season. Yeah. It is a strange acting exercise taking a nine-month break from a character. It definitely takes a couple weeks to be like, okay, who was this person again? Yeah. 
It's strange. Well, I think it's interesting what you said about the second season because for TV shows now, you can tell when a second season is bad because the show only had one story to tell and that was the first season and they feel right. kind of lost in the second rather than sort of creating a world where they can kind of keep building on those characters. And then the second season feels better because it feels like, oh, we we know these actors, we know how to write for them, let's craft stories around that. Yeah. And a lot of shows don't have 15, 16 characters, primary characters. Yeah. So like in this season, you get to know... Betty better, Kia better, yeah. Allison a, a bit better, me better. Like backstory starts to unfold, and you know little bits and pieces of the other uh, women in the show. You're like, oh, what's going on there? And you're gonna wait for that one. <laughs> one uh, one thing that I I really love about Glow is that there isn't a central antagonist to the show. Everybody is kind of their own antagonist at times, mm -hmm. and that is where a lot of the conflict and growth comes with the characters. There isn't like one person trying to show, I mean, there's this one guy in this season, but he's a very minor moment, but it's not like one person trying to shut down the wrestling completely. You know? Oh, right, right. Uh, oh, you mean like a conflict? Well, yeah, well, that's right. There's always inner, inner problems, whether they're power problems within you know, our, our group or between the characters, right? There is no primary villain. Although your character can be quite the sexist pig at times. And I've heard from other people that have come on the stage that you often uh, apologize in between takes and feel really badly about the things that you have to say. Yeah, sometimes because, uh, you know, I say them so effectively. Um, wait, wait, so your apologies actually come from a place of feeling very good about yourself as an actor? Well, it, it's, it's weird. Given the opportunity to be an asshole, who wouldn't take that? And you, you'd be you'd sort of uh, surprising that it's in you to the degree that it is. Maybe I'm speaking for myself. I'd like to generalize it, though. Um, so, yeah, I, and there are some scenes where, like, I'll run up after I've done them with Allison or when I've just basically told her to, like, the, I don't want to ruin it for anybody. In the for, like, the first scene in that first episode, I couldn't have been a bigger asshole. Yeah. And it's, it, there's no other reason for it. So, uh, you know, after that, yeah, I'll run up and be like, are we okay? Are we okay, me and you, Allison? Are we okay? You know, <laughs> and apologize. But, uh, but yeah, I, I guess I'm a sexist pig, but I think we find... The character. Yeah, the character. Um, I'm trying to give you a hand there. Sorry. I appreciate it. Yeah, you don't want to have it be taken out of context and go viral. Marin admits, um, <laughs> finally, we knew it. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, what was I saying? Uh, about the oh yeah I but the, in this season I think you find that Sam has more is more self aware than you would have assumed in the first season I mean even more self aware than I would have assumed as playing the guy like I thought first season this guy's blind side is that you know he's delusional a little bit he's narcissistic uh, he thinks the world of himself and and he's just plowing ahead without being you know without having any self awareness and in this season it sort of unfolds after you know the the, the shock he took at the end of first season that you know he is self aware he he knows who he is. He's not that delusional. And, and, the, and that sort of deepens the relationship between her and I and the characters and also with Allison as well. Go ahead. I, I just want to say I think that in a different actor's hands, the character of Sam could be just a one-dimensional sort of crabby sexist pig. But I and I, I just think that Mark is an amazing actor and adds all these layers of vulnerability and uh, kind of the little boy side of Sam that you can see. I can see it when we do scenes together. I, I see like little Sam in there and I just think it's so beautifully done. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah, I'm so proud of you. Oh, I appreciate well, it. He thinks he's amazing too. So much so right, to the point where he has sure. to apologize is because he's so amazing. Who's that, me? Yes. Oh, oh you're from before. No, like I, I get <laughs> the- uh, Point out my bit, man. <laughs> No, but we have scenes where I can feel when I'm acting, and like I like I feel myself like getting choked up or emotional, and then my first instinct is like your character don't show that. So like I like I shut that off, and that's what you're seeing is you me get, holding in my feelings. Do you get choked up <laughs> and emotional healthy. because the scene is emotional and 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 I don't know. Or, I'm at or, that age. Oh, got it. Um, <laughs> I no because like Sam. Uh, is is stifling himself like you know he's he's he, as a guy he's acting and it's breaking down you know at the end of the first season you know when he realizes that you know there's one movie he was going to make you know his masterpiece 
had been done. Like, he's got nowhere to go. He's got nothing to do. He's got no reason to be doing anything and no way to do it. So, like, this season when he realizes, well, this is who I am, this is my job, that humbling, you know, manifests itself as as Sam is just a reactive guy that his image uh, is shattered, and, and now he's just a guy struggling with being an insecure asshole. And, you know, I understand that. Uh, you do some incredible work in this, not just in the ring, but some of your scenes with, uh, with Allison and, uh, I, I can't really spoil anything, but yeah. the big scene is really beautifully done. Incredible performances on both sides. Thank you so much. Um, what is it like crafting those scenes with, with Allison and building that relationship over the course of the season? Yeah. Well, I, I always think back to the first episode of season one I, I just took for granted that we Allison and I really only have two scenes where we're still friends and then our friendship implodes and for the rest of our time together 20 episodes we all our scenes together we can barely make eye contact and we're sort of um, you know we never really get to be friends again I hope they do someday but uh, anytime I'm in a scene Debbie and Ruth, I always sort of picture in my head that one hand has a knife ready to like shiv the other person and the other hand is reaching out, you know, asking to be friends again. And it's that sort of constant push and pull. I think that, you know, their friendship, they're sort of soul mirrors of each other, I think, and really know each other's true kind of, uh, you know, 12 year old dreamer selves. Um, and I think if they were a different kind of friendship, um, the betrayal that happened in season one would probably just end their friendship and they'd never speak again. But I think that it's very telling that the relationship that Debbie mourns the most, uh, the loss of is her friendship with Ruth and not her marriage. Really? <laughs> I, yeah, oh, that's totally. Great. That's yeah. nice. Yeah, because, you know, the husbands, he's sort of a bore, right? Yeah, yeah. but I love that actor, Rich oh, Sommer. Yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He just always seems so, you know, like, uh, power, you know, like, <laughs> God, he's very good, but yes. the character, it's the character, not him. For sure. Uh, I also think with, um, with Debbie, there's an unwillingness, and maybe with Ruth, there's like an unwillingness to accept, because she's so close with Ruth to a certain degree, unwilling to accept the way that she hurts another person at first. Debbie's you know? unwilling. Yeah. Yes. It, 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 it yes. really is an affront oh, yeah. to her to hear how she hurts another person. Right. Yeah. I mean, I th in season two, I think we see glimpses of the dynamic of what their friendship was like before we met them and the flaws in the friendship before Ruth, you know, betrayed Debbie. I think that it's very much, I think women can relate to this relationship where Debbie was the alpha friend and Ruth sort of the sidekick beta friend and I think Debbie probably did like 70% of the talking at lunch and, and successful more successful more successful big, than yeah. Ruth yes yeah and I think kind of um treated Ruth like a sort of Igor sidekick friend it really loved her but I think uh you know overlooked uh Ruth's apparent loneliness and need for uh, love and to be heard. And I think Debbie just sort of had blinders on um, and is learning, uh, you know, I think both becoming a mother and um, separating from her husband and ha losing her best friend. I think she's experiencing vulnerability and uh, weakness on a level that you know, it's like when a person, you know, bases their personality on having status in a conversation and confidence, and then when the rug gets pulled out from under them, you know, where, what is your personality when you can't tell everyone what to do because your life's a mess? And that's, that. I love playing that with Debbie, you know, thinking that she's still the queen of the world and, you know, her brain is a soup on fire. But she's so privately a mess. Yeah, And we yeah, see that insane. so often in this, in this yeah, season. Yeah, she's whenever, such a mess. Yeah, anytime she has alone moments, she's just unraveling completely. Oh, yes. yeah, that whole, that whole episode with her and Kia, just the split between her character and, and uh, Kia's character, uh, where it's just a, basically it's an episode of, with her life and Kia's life is like great. She's that the one at Stanford and the one at yeah, the home, yeah, with the yeah, bedroom, yeah. the bed, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's the best. Betty's the best. I love you, Mark. Yeah, yeah I requested from our showrunners uh, that Debbie never has a season where she's taking vitamins and doing great. I was like, I never <laughs> want to play someone who's, you know, just in a really great place. It's boring. 
And I did really, I, you know, I really love that scene with, 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 with Alice and Ruth because I, I think I personally relate very much to someone being like, you do this to me. And you're like, what are you talking about? I don't do that. Yeah. And getting right. really angry right. and yes. defensive and then having to come back later and be like, I do all of those things. Right, yes. I apologize. Yep. Yeah. I think it's important to note that uh, Betty here, when you watch the show, invented the uh, that smile that she does when she's, <laughs> what's the character's name? Maybe don't do this. The though. Liberty Bell. <laughs> <laughs> the Liberty Bell smile when she just walks into it. It's like one of the most bizarre, uh, frightening, beautiful things yeah. on television. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Playing Liberty Bell is the funnest. I mean, I <laughs> I lost... You look like you're having an amazing time playing it's Liberty so Bell. It's so insanely fun, and I get to play her a lot this season. And I, I lost a lot of jobs making too big of choices and auditions, and they were like, no, you know, Kelsey's really, you know, Kelsey. grounded and small <laughs> and really squinty. And I was like, but what if she's insane? <laughs> They're like, yeah, you don't get the job. Um, so Liberty Bell is my opportunity to kind of let loose all the crazy bees that I've been keeping inside for so long. Because every woman has them. I feel like there's this myth uh, that, you know, only a certain kind of woman is layered and complicated. And then, you know, the Barbies and Pixie Dream Girls are just like a set of three traits that come in in overalls. And they're like, I have a question for you. Like, they're they're crying yeah, in the bathroom, a, too. <laughs> yeah. You dropped into that very quickly. I imagine that's a routine audition that you have to do as an actress. Yes. When, when she was trying, when in the first season, I don't know how much, she, I know some of it was on camera, but when Betty was putting trying to figure out who Liberty Bell would be, like there were these different versions of her. It was hilarious. Yeah. How much of that is on? Did I mean I mean, uh, like some? First. Yeah, there was some, but like there was a lot of it. When you well, I had pitched to them. Uh, I was like, oh, maybe Liberty Bell is, you know, uh, when she's um, when she's not angry, she's a Southern Belle, oh, yeah. and when she gets mad, she turns into like you know, like a methed out crazy trailer part. And they and Liz and Carly said, no, you know, in life is very complicated and gray, and wrestling is good versus evil. It's very black and white. There's no mess in wrestling. You know exactly where you stand and who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. Leave the mess to Debbie, and you know, let Liberty Bell be a beauty queen on crack. I was like, she I will do that. And in that specific, uh, that episode that's in the, I think like in the middle of the season, in the season, again, I can't give anything away, but this it's really season? great. This oh, yeah, season, yeah. the very sort of specific, almost like one-off episode that you guys do, that's, uh, oh, right. you know what I'm referring to? The, the, the aerobics workout video is really funny. Yeah. Yeah. That is really her on crack yeah. in yeah. that moment. Yeah. yeah. I keep waiting. I guess I have PTSD from doing jobs where people are like, okay, we're going to go again and just take it down. Just <laughs> quieter, smaller, everything. Stop all the choices. And Stop on this action. job, they're like, what if we just turned it up? I'm like, I, up. Uh, my face hurts from the facial expressions. I was like, okay, let's do I mean, they're asking us all to be the most insane feminist Muppet in a blender versions of ourselves. Now, what was that like going into this season? Because last season, it's you were sort of building up to the wrestling and there was a lot of rehearsals. And in this, we are in the midst of like, you know, you guys are doing a lot of wrestling in this season. Yeah, we're doing a ton of wrestling. Yeah, they are doing a ton of wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to just kind of kick it and, and hang out. Yeah, I, I do a lot of this. My turn? Okay, yeah. I'll wait. Yeah, that's yeah. what I do. And I'm sometimes happy. you walk from the chair that you sit in to the standing position, and that's brave. Yeah, I do a lot of brave. I make a lot of brave choices. Yeah, yeah. No, I I love watching them wrestle, and there and there's the it's def. I'm happy there's a lot of wrestling. Like when I watch the season, because I'm not there for a lot of it. I don't have to be there the whole time. You know, off camera. I don't know if you knew that, but Sam can leave. I just don't know how TV's yeah. how it works. How does it? <laughs> like I don't need to be present when I'm not on camera, and. Uh, but you guys aren't your characters? I no, don't no, 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 we, I Not don't, real. I live 10 minutes away. I, I sometimes go home for lunch even to record my podcast. Um, but, but yeah, it's amazing to watch it. I, as, as a watcher of the viewer of the show, I hadn't seen most of the season cause I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there the whole time. So I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. They're really doing it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, in the in the in the final episode, you do a move, and it's clearly you on camera, and it's an incredible move. Uh, how much yeah. how much practice, how much rehearsal goes into learning all this stuff, and then being able to execute it? Um, definitely in the first season, they 
treated us with kid gloves of like, okay, we're going to do this move once and you're so brave for doing it. Thank you. And then season two, they were like, do it again. Yeah, we yeah, didn't get it. They, we weren't rolling on that one. It was get up. Yeah. It was way tougher. I would say, <laughs> um, but so much fun and I love wrestling which is such a strange term for my life to take and we're Ali and I are definitely very right now self-righteous about doing everything and it never being a stunt double I wonder if in future seasons we'll be like put a wig on a mop and have her do it I Sitting mean with it Mark hurts on the a side lot and be like, just have the stunt double <laughs> yes. hanging out yes. with Mark yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a plot Painful. there's a plot line in the season I believe we see a, uh, a glimpse of it in the trailer so I'm not spoiling too much but it's definitely referential uh, to uh, the Me Too movement and what we've been talking about when it comes to Hollywood. And I don't want to say Weinstein because that always kind of uh, sells it short in terms of how prevalent this is because that was so extreme. Yeah. Um, what was it like to know? I know it's not in regards to your character specifically outside of her response to it, mm -hmm. um, but what was it like getting those scripts and, and seeing that the writers were going were gonna to go there and kind of tackle this? Well, a lot of... Uh, a lot of the themes that we bring up in season two feel ripped from the headlines, but it was all written pre-Me Too and pre-Time's Up. Um, sadly, sexism and bro-y gargoyle creeps um, are a staple of society for hundreds of years. Thousands. Um, thousands, thousands of years. Of yeah, years. yeah. <laughs> Gross the patriarchy pavement. patriarchy has ruled with its penis. That's right, Mark. Thank you so much for that sound bite. Um, <laughs> uh, so you, oh, man, the patriarchy is ruled with his penis. I'm a yeah, sexist yeah. jerk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He says no. Mark is a woke buttercup. <laughs> yeah, I have my days. You know. I love this man. Mm. Um, yes. So I think people may watch that episode and be like, "Oh, this is a reference to X," and it's not. Um, it's just an experience that ha many, 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 sadly, women have had. Many, many times. That well, I think the show has always explored uh, a lot of these issues. But I think, as I said before, what's so wonderful about this show is that I never feel like it goes into, a, you know, an issue as being something saying we want to explore this sh this issue. It's always about the characters and it's always about being entertaining and dramatic. Yeah. First. That's what, that's what the benefit of having playwrights <laughs> as showrunners. You, you know, yes. they're, they're both TV writers, but they come from the theater. So I, I think that they're, they're very character centric. There's no real written jokes you know this show is not a joke to joke show the comedy happens organically you know there's no they're not sacrificing uh any character sort of behavior or momentum by you know putting them in situations that wouldn't be right or having them say things that wouldn't work so th that i think that's unique there's not one incident as a comic you know i i there's not one incident where you know you got to say like i don't think we should do this joke because it doesn't fit the scene. They just, they don't write like that. Yeah. It's all character driven. I think, and because it's character driven, Glow is a show, one of the few shows that really gets to kind of have its cake and eat it at the same time. There are big, beautiful moments that are funny and romantic that in a lot of other shows could fall apart and be cliche. But because of how character focused this show is, you do get to have the big kiss. You do get to have the big song in the final moment. And it works really well. And also they're not hammering the period in a campy way. No. They just let it be. And I think that makes a big difference. You're just sort of living in the 80s. You're not like saying like, we're in the 80s. You know, it's a different thing. Uh, going back though to the um, the Me Too, uh, I hate to, I don't want to categorize it as that, but this 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 plot line in this episode. Yeah, just call it the way things should be. No, the <laughs> way things shouldn't be. shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The new way. Uh, your your character's response to to what happens, and I'm being cagey, I know, because I can't I don't can't really give too much. Yeah. What was it like having to sort of say those words and do that scene, or do you just feel like when you're doing it, that's the character I can kind of cut my own. A, Feelings off yeah, there were a couple scripts this season where I saw some of Debbie's lines or reactions to things, and I was like, oh, God, I don't, I'm so disappointed in her. I don't want her to react that way. But, you know, I think that um, oftentimes we, uh, in writing, we kind of forgive ourselves in retrospect. We make the kind of outwardly mwahaha characters sexist or racist and, you know, good prevails. And, you know, that's not, sadly, not the way the world is. People who uh, you seem to like or care about say things that you're like, wait, what did you just say? Mm -hmm. um, and I think for Debbie, uh, some of the, I think she found it, 
as I do as an actor, it's very easy to believe the things that this business tells you are valuable about yourself, things that are going to expire, youth, beauty, whatever, uh, expires in 30 seconds. Um, you look great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, but, you know, I think that um, when you're told, okay, you've got this window of time to be an actress. For actors, it's a different story. They've got decades. For you, it's this window of time. Uh, and I think that, you know, she sort of has a pretty prevalent male gaze representative in her brain telling her, this is what's valuable about you. This is what you need to do as an actress. And I think uh, for Debbie and for me, it's about trying to kill that person in your own brain. And I think without giving too much away, seeing Ruth react in a way, a different way than maybe Debbie would have. She feels very defensive and realizes, oh, there are things about me that I don't like, so I'm gonna lash out at you. She defends very much the status quo, right. which protects Chris right. in the situation. Right, because you've made those compromises yes. as yeah. a character in yeah. your life. Yes. So there's the shame that goes with that and the self-hatred and then the justification. What's wild is that this takes place in the 80s, but the justification is one that we heard, you know, just in the past year. We heard people still saying, justifying it this way. Well, what did you think would happen? You went there, that right. kind of stuff. Right, yeah. Well, I think what Liz Flayhive and Carly Mensch, the show creators, do so well in GLOW is, you know, even though there are 15 different women and Mark, uh, there's... There's a unity in what makes us feel lonely or ashamed. And I think that those things we are being vocal about for the first time, um, you know, at the Women's March, I felt like, uh, oh, these are all women who felt the same things that I did uh, alone and scared in my room. And I thought I was the only person feeling that way. Oh, when we're vocal about it, it's powerful and there's unity to be found there. And I think that, uh, this show is about a bunch of people trying to keep it together at work and then feeling different levels of loneliness, shame, disappointment in their own lives as their lives fall apart. Uh, and, you know, I think throughout a day, you can feel such self-hatred and sadness and questioning and also have this tiny person inside being like, but maybe I'm a superhero. Maybe I'm... Maybe I'm Liberty Bell. Maybe I'm Zoya. Uh, maybe if someone gave me a chance, I, I could do something like Greek level special with my life. Um, and I think that's a, a thing that links all of these characters. You know, Mark, I've been a fan of your podcast, I think, since the very early days of it. And I remember, I remember, you know, before the show, Marin, you used to talk about yourself as an actor, as someone who was terrible at acting, and you would get cut out of movies. I think you were cut out of a Cameron Crowe movie or something like that, you said? No, I was cut out of The Angry Ducks, the second one. <laughs> I I think that, like... Angry Ducks? I, yeah, or not the the Mighty Ducks. The Mighty, the Mighty Ducks. Ducks. Oh, yeah. that's what it was. It was the Mighty. The well, Mighty Ducks. Why did I think Cameron Crowe? <laughs> because I because I was in Almost Famous. Oh, you were in. Excuse me. Sorry. I yeah. I I think I was always. I wanted you know. I studied acting in college and I studied a bit after, but I just sort of was no good at auditioning for for dumb TV shows. I just there were guys better than me, and I would I would always be too angry in general, I've which is the, what got me out cut out of the Mighty Ducks. I've heard that the best way to actually audition for a lot of bad TV shows has nothing to do with your acting. It has to do with being able to be really positive about. Right, that's a wrong. Scripts. I'm the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah. That wrong guy. No, the the ducks was like I I just had his little part because my uh, old friend of mine Steve Brill directed it and I was a valet in Beverly Hills and they were you know yeah I was this bitter in the valet movie in the movie oh. and and the ducks are wandering around Beverly Hills and they can't get into stores and I oh I remember right and they come up to me and they're like how do we do whatever and I'm like you you got to know somebody to get into anywhere in this town and. And there was like, you know, I did a take where I, I, I engaged with the ducks and the director comes up to me and goes, you know, you're, you're scaring the ducks. <laughs> so, so I was too intense in, in yelling and they were all freaked out. And I did it like three or four times, but it didn't make the cut. But I have it on VHS. If well, you what's it. it like to <laughs> grow into a, a really good actor? I, well, I thank point. God I had my show on for four, you know, for the four seasons I did. And, you know, I was able to explore who I was publicly as a character for four years and, and sort of know the parameters of, of my talent and also, you know, being on set and, you know, understanding how everything works. So by the time 
I got Glow, which I wasn't really anticipating getting or, or didn't think I would, but I wanted to do something that wasn't inherently me. Um, didn't they I, reach out to you specifically from... Well, the, uh, my oh. management thought it would be good for me, so I put myself on tape, oh, if okay. that, well, that's what they still call it. I, that, the, my, someone videotaped me doing it. We sent it in, and I was cast off of that. We didn't know what they were looking for. No, they didn't ask for me. Oh. They, I don't think they knew what they wanted, but uh, I guess they decided on me. So to have the opportunity to play somebody that wasn't me but also to have it within my emotional world uh, in terms of what I could do uh, was, you know, was a great gift. So I, I, I feel pretty confident. And, it's, and what, like we were talking about the second season, when I got there, I'm like, can I find this guy again? And I was talking to Dax Shepard, and he said he had the same feelings on Parenthood, but uh, Kristen Bell had told him, like, no, that's just the second season. You know, I mean, you're in the person. You know, you put on the pants, and, you know, I get my hair blown dry, and, like, I'm in it. Like, you, you don't have to put the work back into it right. that you put in the first season. You're that guy on some level. You walk into it once you put the pants on. Yeah. I don't know what your question was, but... No, that, was a, that was a really good answer. But what is it like to sort of be operating in this sort of, in this, in this way where it's in your emotional range, but it seems like because it's in that box that you feel comfortable in, they can kind of consistently be expanding the box more and more Well, that's more what they you. do. That's the benefit of uh, being on a show that's sort of... Uh, still being written while you're doing it. Like, after the first season and by the middle of the first season, they could write for any of us. Mm -hmm. And they could make choices with the character, you know, in the middle of the season to, to see what you could do or what you couldn't do or what the, they wanted to do with you personally. They they saw what the actors were doing. Yeah, and I'm willing to do... You know, I'm willing to take chances, that's for sure. I mean, I showed my butt last season because I thought it was the right thing to do. Um, was it a contract? You, it was in your contract? Well, they were like, all else. the women had to sign these nudity deals, you know, contracts, and, and they asked me, and I'm like, well, I got to, right? And then the day came, and I'm like, I'd rather it be the back. You know, like, so... <laughs> I like, didn't I, know this. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I can live with my ass being out there as sure. a meme. I didn't need my dick, you know, out there. Yeah. I got, you know, I got... You know, you feel a certain way about that. Absolutely. Yeah. So... I don't know what will happen third season now that I've put that in the world, but we'll see. Uh, Everyone will see. Let's get some questions from our audience. What do we got? <laughs> um, first and foremost, uh, Mark, huge fan, uh, great comedian, awesome uh, podcast. I love it. Uh, two questions. One, in terms of glow, uh, I understand it's, it's wrestling and all of that, but what were your favorite wrestlers or era uh, of the time of WWF or, or uh, WCW, ECW that influenced your characters? Uh, and another one, uh, part two, speaking on WTF, any particular uh, guest that you still want to bring? I'm still waiting on Tom Waits. Uh, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. He's a hard get. Most of the guys that you think I'd want, just they're just hard to get. Albert Brooks. I can't seem to get Lily Tomlin. You know, I it, you know weights would be great. You know, it's just like it's a matter of like, do they want to talk about themselves for an hour? Uh, do they want to you know go to you know come to my house? I, you, are they out doing that? There's a lot of sometimes people think I have this magic ability. But they're like, why aren't you getting Tom Waits? I'm like, oh, you're right. <laughs> Let me call him. You know, it, it's a process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he talks to one person a decade. So yeah. how do I make myself that guy? Yeah. Like Chappelle's another one. I see him around occasionally. He knows what I do. But I'm going to have to wait. Like, I got to put the shit in my car to record just in case Dave's like, let's do it now. Right. You know, so, like, right, right, right. you know, it, 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 I, I, I'm aware and I'm trying. Gotcha. Thank you. And for wrestlers, I did not watch wrestling at all growing up at all. Um, and always thought it was kind of weird and I didn't understand it. But watching it once I got the job, there's so many parallels to, strangely, being super into theater and musicals. Like, a lot of my friends didn't understand. They're like, that's a weird, embarrassing, cringy thing that you're into. And I'm like, I love it. Like, why, you know, there's something so powerful and vulnerable about bursting into song. And there's nothing <laughs> more powerful and vulnerable than being in a glitter diaper fighting for justice. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of similarities. I didn't really grow up with it, you know, because I'm 54. So it, it wasn't my thing. And I always thought, like, well, why wasn't I? Because when I was a kid, what was it, like 63, 73, 
So like 75, maybe I would have been the age where it would sort of sink in. What was going on in wrestling in 75? I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was like regional wrestling, Sunday afternoon, on TV. And back then, it was just like dudes with bleach blonde hair and unitards bleeding, you know, and yelling at each other. Uh, you know, I, I don't Stark. remember. Well, no, but it is sort of, that was what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't like this amazing spectacle. It was kind of raw and weird. And I remember wrestling magazines at Skaggs Pharmacy, just bleeding bloody guys holding their hair like another dude. So it wasn't like I didn't think like, yeah, that's, that seems like a life for me or, or that, that looks fun. So I missed it. But I've talked to several wrestlers on the podcast, and I just watched the Andre the Giant documentary. So oh I feel like that's I love amazing. that guy. Ooh, yeah. That was emotional. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Next question. For both of you, do you see this show like some of you as a comedy or some – as a social commentary or perhaps something else? And the side question, which is your favorite character on the show other than the ones that you play? Ooh. Oh, boy. It's going to start trouble. I don't see it as a, as a comedy in, in a structural sense. I see it as, uh, I think it's a slice of life show. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. It, it, it sort of transcends genre definitions because you want it to be a comedy, but it, it isn't. It just seems like with the spectacle of wrestling, that you know, it, it should live in that area. But I don't think it's a comedy. I don't know what I would call it. Yeah, sometimes when people say, oh, it's so funny. I'm like, really? Because I'm ripping my soul out for you. Like when they said, someone said, oh, that scene when you come in in the pilot with the baby and you're sobbing, that's hilarious. I'm like, I am sobbing. Like, I'm glad you find that funny. But that is, that's how life is, I guess. And how, you know, I think these characters, if you told them, we're going to make a show about your life. I think it would be the negative image of the things that you see in their brain. They'd be like, oh, show this part. And they're like, oh, no, we want to see when you're crying by yourself in there. Or when you think this is a dramatic moment, and we're going to be laughing at you. I think it's sort of the opposite of what they would think. And my favorite character, I mean, I love Sam. I know, that's all right. I love you. Um, uh, I would say Sheila the She-Wolf. Gail Rankin is a... Juilliard trained actress. She is unreal and so amazing in this season. And Kia Stevens, uh, who plays Tame, um, is gets to shine in this season. She's oh, yeah, my I think heart. that's unbelievable. I would, I would think, yeah, I would think Kia, yeah. <laughs> She's got a great episode of this season. She's got a great episode, but as an actress, you know, you, you see, you know, the, the other side of Welfare Queen, but that character, Welfare Queen, is insane. Yeah, insane. The, the way she, because she's a wrestler, and she, she knows all the tricks of just, like, how to immediately make herself contemptible, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, in a second. Yeah, a good heel. Yeah, a great yeah. heel. Yeah, and that's... Real, wait, the actress is a real wrestler? Yeah. She's a pro wrestler, yeah. Oh, wow. Yes, she's the only one of us who knows what she's Amazing doing. Amazing con, right? <laughs> Yes, awesome con. Awesome yeah. con, yeah. yeah. That's right, I remember that. But like the, the, what she brought up is interesting because, you know, in comedy, you, you, know, you're, you, you have sort of a, a broadened character thing. You have a, almost a caricature uh, 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 as, you know, the people in it that, you know, you become bigger than yourself to do a comedic role. And that is being occupied by the wrestling, which is, is in this show, fairly serious business. So it, it's, it, it's, it, it sort of transcends genre a little bit. If I could say something that sounds intellectual and silly. Yeah. A lot of times it feels like I'm doing two different shows. I'm like, oh, I play Debbie, and those are quiet, you know, sort of kitchen sink real scenes. And then I'm on this other show where I'm like Blanche Dubois falling down the stairs, insane, like (laughs) toddlers and tiaras entrance. It's, it's, yeah, it's two totally different things. I think that's what balances it out. It's weird because if you watch Glow and you're like, why, you know, this is heavy shit, some of it. Yeah, you know, but it, and it, but it never sinks to a point where you walk away from an episode going like, I don't know, man, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, it, because of the because the wrestling, because the other world part of the show, so silly. it's so fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I also think like uh, unlike other lesser shows that wanna, un, yeah, unlike lesser shows that wanna be dramatic, it doesn't really rub. Glow doesn't rub your face in miserableism when it's no. a little sad. You know, the right. characters are right. distraught and in moments that are unfortunate and you believe it, but it doesn't feel like someone's trying to prove to us that they've written something real and miserable. Yeah, t- you trying know? to gut right. punch you all the time. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hi, guys. How are Hi. you? Hi, good. good. How are you? Uh, first off, I'll say I'm a little under the weather, so I kind of sound like a dude. Yeah, well, so, Yeah. <laughs> and I will say that I'll, I'm going to binge tonight on Glow. I'm a little late to the game. 
But um, my question is for you, Mark. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of your podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I actually work down the street as a drug and medical device paralegal. So I'm like constantly here on my lunch break because, you know, yeah. why not? You know, yeah. see yeah. celebrities. That's yeah. great. So, um, you know, you get me through the work day. Oh, good. And um, two of my favorite podcasts were Jennifer Lawrence and yeah. Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> so I was wondering which uh, were your favorite podcasts to record. Oh, I don't know. Those were that Jennifer Lawrence, like, you know, she gets... You got to pay attention, man. You got to like stay with Jennifer Lawrence. You better lock in and you realize like, oh, we're not going to get a straight answer here about anything. I don't even know where this is going. And she's very, she's, she's funny because she was very, dis she, she's disarming in a weird way. Like, um, like I, she needed to use the restroom when she got to my house. And then she came out, and we're about to go out to the garage. And she just looks at me, and she goes, I just took a shit in your bathroom. Can't believe you just said that. And so now you're sitting there with, like, the biggest star, you know, on, in movies going, oh, okay, good. All right, thanks for that information. And so right away, you're kind of, like, off, you're off your, your footing. And then you got to, you know, kind of, you know, manage that conversation. But the, I don't know. Like, they're all, it's, like, a lot. You know what I mean? That. But, uh, but no, people ask me that. I don't know. There's very few I don't get something out of, and there's so many that are, are so far in, in the background of my mind that, but there, I don't, I, out of, I'm surprised by all of them. I mean, even, like, just like, you know, last week when I had Josh Brolin on, I mean, that was, that was a, a, a kind of a, a very surprising and engaging episode. Rachel Bloom, I, I was like, you know, she sort of took me to task, and that was sort of, like, visceral. And, I mean, they're all... They're all pretty good. I mean, I think that most of the time, the ones that people think are the most amazing ones, or that should be, were really like, you know, it's usually the people that no one knows that, that kind of sneak up on you, where you're like, holy shit. Like, if you listen to the Bobby Kelly episode, he's a Boston comic who lives here, Robert Kelly. I mean, that thing's like two hours, like, what the fuck? You know, or Jay Okerson. There's a lot that are just kind of slip under the radar, you know? My but, episode. Betty's was amazing. There were, there were moments during Betty's where I, I could barely contain myself, yeah. tearing up, wondering if she was going to be okay, moving <laughs> through it, you know. But that's the case sometimes when you're, when you're interviewing people is when you're like, oh, you don't know exactly how to do this yet, and so you're giving up everything. Yeah. And this is amazing. And I don't mean that in a cynical way. I just mean like, oh, this is a wildly open, candid interview because no one has sort of trained you before. Going I don't know if that's this. true. Yeah. I, I think that most people at this point know what my show is, and they can decide, you know, either in it or, or before it or whenever they want to, what they're going to. I mean, I think somebody who is cagey or managed, it's usually self-censoring. I don't let publicists sit in the room. But I think there's been a lot of people who have been very candid and have surprised themselves, you know, not to the point where they call me up and go, like, you know, could you take the part out where I, you know, threw the kid out the window? You know, so, like, but... But, but, you know, they, I, I think there have, been, there have been moments, you can hear him, like Willem Dafoe, we're like within 10 minutes where he's like, well, I can't even, why am I telling you? Why, why am I telling you? And then he shut down. Like, he had to, like, I don't know what made him comfortable, but he started talking about his childhood, and then he stopped himself. And that's a guy that's been doing it for, you know, 50 years already. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a, a matter of undisciplined or, or uninformed people in terms of how to behave in an interview. I just think, you know, either they're comfortable or they get comfortable or they don't. Like Josh Brolin talked about using heroin. I mean, you know, and that guy's been very well coached. And there's things in his past that I'm sure he wouldn't want to talk about. But he just volunteered that up. I didn't say, like, tell me about the heroin. So what are you going to do? I, well, for me, I'm just, I'll just sit there and be like, oh, okay, <laughs> here we go. I don't say that with my mouth. And he's going, here comes the good shit. Well, yeah, there's a moment where you're like, like either if I feel myself starting to cry or I feel myself wanting to, uh, you know, step in and, and comfort them. It took me a long time not to interrupt emotions on the podcast and in acting as well, just to let somebody have them. You know, I've learned to offer a Kleenex or, you know what I mean, as opposed to just let people you know, kind of like hanging there. And I've also got an air purifier because Ed, Helm, Ed Helms almost died on my podcast. And I didn't stop the tape. He's allergic to cats. And about 45 minutes in, he was like audibly wheezing. And I'm like, we got 15 minutes left. We're not going to, can't stop. <laughs> Let me just turn on the purifier. Hopefully that doesn't. I didn't have one then. Oh, you didn't Someone, have it then. A fan sent me one because of Ed Helms. Oh, wow. Like you should have this in the garage. Because I didn't think it was that bad. Yeah. I saw Ed yesterday. He's okay with me. 
Uh, one more. Hi, you Hi. guys kind of hinted at this earlier, but I was wondering how much involvement do you guys have with the showrunners and writing the episodes and creating the characters and that kind of thing? Not much. I, 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 I don't. I mean, I had suggestions at the beginning, you know, when they, how they saw the guy. Uh, you know, they had a backstory for me that, you, you know, I, 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 I kind of use it. But, but uh, I kind of trust the scripts. I mean, if we're on set and we really, I think if, if something doesn't stick well or doesn't sit well, you know, we can discuss it with them. It's not like they're very open. It's a very communicative and uh, collaborative set. But, you know, they do their job and I do mine, right? Yeah. I mean, I worked with Liz Flayhive and Carly Mensch on Nurse Jackie. They were both writers on that show. And uh, they knew me and sort of were able to write once I got the part they were able to sort of write for me a little bit um but uh yeah I think that you know I they don't while they don't tell me what's going to happen I have had the experience of working on a show where you're telling yourself okay this is my backstory and then you get a script where you're like okay that's the complete opposite of what I was thinking um so I will email them sometimes and be like this is what I'm thinking maybe where she's from, what happened to her today, where she, how she feels about this person, and they they either say yes or no. Um, but they don't let the puppets have any power. <laughs> yeah, they'll pretend like you do for a minute. Right. Oh yeah, we can try a take. Yeah, like sure. That. Yeah, yeah, let's do a take. And then just like give that. me one where it's not like that, yeah. <laughs> and then they use that one. <laughs> I love the show. Congratulations on Thanks. season two. Uh, I watched it all in a day. I couldn't stop. Oh wow, great! It. So <laughs> fantastic. I swear I have a life, but I watched it all. In a day. Oh, that's good. good. Uh, Five hours. That's true. It premieres on Netflix June 29th. Everybody, please give Betty and Mark a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.